but it's going to be shown on the computer. It's set. Well, why not? Well, why wouldn't they? Why, they? Oh, they don't do what? They don't do every, every commit here. Oh. And I spent so much time getting picking out this time. The rule is we can only allow two. You can sit behind them. Okay. Why does it matter? Because there are rules. But rules why a vacancy is a vacancy, no. I would think. Rules are rules. Kelly, I need you behind me. I don't care what you call one. No, I don't care. Mitch already was teetering on the brink, brink of being. He can't get out because Gary's blocking him. He's trapped because Gary has his leg up. <laughs> John. See this? For you now. Nice Come shoes, here. James. Mitch, Kelly has a question for you. Come here. Say, excuse me. Can you let Mitch out, please? He feels he needs to. <laughs> He's too shy to ask. Sims just walked down. Here we go.
the uh, Information Policy Census and National Archives Subcommittee uh, will now come to order. Good afternoon and welcome to today's hearing entitled uh, National Archives and Records Administration Organizational Issues. Uh, and without objection, the chair and ranking member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. And the purpose of today's hearing is to examine the loss of external hard drive containing data from the Executive Office of the Clinton Administration. We will hear from the acting archivist, uh, Adrian Thomas, uh, and the, the NARA Inspector General, Paul Brackfield, Brackfell, uh, and we hope to get real insight into how uh, the security breach occurred and what steps have been taken and what steps should be taken to tighten security at NARA facilities. Uh, the missing hard drive, which is a backup copy, contained the entire computer files of 113 White House employees. Their entire computer files were, uh, were downloaded and stored on a hard drive and later transferred to the backup hard drive that is now missing. Classified documents and personally identifiable information of former Clinton administration staff and visitors uh, to the White House are now exposed. Uh, before uh, we continue with this hearing, uh, let us be very clear that the subcommittee has no intention of interfering or impeding the investigations currently being conducted by the NARA Inspector General, the Secret Service, or the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We urge everyone's cooperation with these investigations, uh, and I thank all of our witnesses for appearing today and look forward to their testimonies. Uh, now, we are on a, a tight schedule today. Uh, so what I am going to do is uh, normally we would yield to the ranking member who is not here yet. When he gets here, he will be allowed an opening statement. But I will swear uh, the witnesses in. I'll introduce you and swear you in. Uh, and hopefully by the end, the minority member will be here. Uh, let me first introduce the panel. We will hear first from Ms. Adrian Thomas acting archivist of the United States National Archives and Records Administration. Uh, Ms. Thomas is currently the acting archivist of the, of the United States prior to her appointment as acting ar archivist in December 2008. Ms. Thomas serves as, as the deputy archivist of the United States. Ms. Thomas has been with the National Archives for 38 years, beginning as an, an archivist trainee in the Office of Presidential Libraries and subsequently holding a number of policy and administrative roles. Uh, Ms. Thomas will be a accompanied by Mr. Gary M. Stern, uh, General Counsel for the National Archives and Records Administration. W welcome to both of you. Uh, our next witness will be Mr. Paul Brackfell, Ins Inspector General, National Archives and Records Administration. Mr. Brackfell serves as, as the IG of NARA uh, and, and as the IG for, for NARA. He oversees the conduct and execution of all audits, investigations, and inspections for the agency in compliance with provisions of the Inspector General Act of 1978 as amended. Mr. Brackfell's entire career has been devoted to investigative activities since graduating from the University of Maryland College Park in 1979. Go Terps! And today he brings 10 years 
of experience as the NARA Inspector General and 30 years of exceptional service uh, to the U.S. Government. Currently at NARA, Mr. Brackfell's tenure has included the recovery of hundreds of stolen archival holdings and related successful prosecutions of identified subjects. And we look forward to his testimony. I want to welcome all of you to our hearing today. Uh, and it is the policy of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee to swear in all witnesses before they testify. Would all of you please stand and raise your right hand? Do you? She may also be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. You may be seated. Thank you. Let the record reflect that the witness is answered in the affirmative, uh, and each of you will have five minutes to make opening statements. Uh, your complete written testimony will be included in the hearing record. The yellow light will indicate that it is time to sum up. The red light will indicate that your time has expired. Uh, Ms. Thomas, you may begin your opening statement. Green, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Clay. And members of the subcommittee, I appreciate this opportunity to discuss a recent security incident that is a serious breach of the trust placed in the National Archives to protect our nation's records. NARA learned in late March that an external computer hard drive containing copies of Clinton Administration Executive Office of the President records was missing from an electronic records processing room. As the acting archivist and as someone who has devoted my entire 39-year career to the National Archives, I'm deeply angered that a NARA employee or contractor may have intentionally removed this item. With me today are NARA's General Counsel and Senior Agency Official for Privacy, Gary Stern, and Sharon Thibodeau, Deputy Assistant Archivist for Records Services. The loss of the hard drive occurred while NARA was conducting preservation processing of electronic media received from the Executive Office of the President, or EOP, at the end of the Clinton administration. Tapes containing snapshots of the contents of the working drives of EOP employees were copied by a contractor to new media to prevent deterioration. On September 18, 2008, two My Book hard drives created by the contractor were delivered to NARA. The hard drives were labor, labeled Master Number 2 and Backup Number 2. The two hard drives were taken to Suite 5300 at the National Archives in College Park and placed on a shelf in the unclassified electronic records processing room within the suite. At the time, approximately 85 NARA employees and contractors had badges that opened the three doors to the office area of the suite. Individuals with badge access to Suite 5300 also had access to the electronic records processing room for unclassified records. On October 30th, the work of verifying the records on the hard drive was assi assigned to an information technology specialist. Work was performed only on the master number two hard drive, not the backup number two, which would later be missing. On February 5th, 2009, the IT specialist placed the master number two hard drive into its original manufacturer's box and noted that the backup number two hard drive was in a similar adjacent box. The two boxes remained on a shelf in the processing room and no additional work was done on the hard drive until March 24, 2009, when the IT specialist discovered that the box that had contained backup number two hard drive was empty. The master number two hard drive was still in its box. An immediate division-wide search was initiated. On April 2, 2009, the Inspector General General Counsel and I were informed of the loss. While the Office of the Inspector General continues its investigation, there are currently no facts to determine whether the drive was stolen or misplaced and no suspect has been identified. NARA has offered a reward of up to $50,000 for information that leads to the recovery of the missing hard drive. 
NARA staff reviewed the master number two hard drive and discovered that it contained numerous files containing personal names and social security numbers. In addition, NARA also found a small number of files that contain markings indicating that they may contain classified information. While information from the EOP provided at the time of transfer indicated that the hard drives did not contain classified data, we believe EOP, EOP employees must have accidentally or improperly stored some classified information on their unclassified computers. We are compiling a list of those individuals who may have had their personal information compromised and a credit monitoring contractor is notifying these individuals as they are identified. To date, approximately 15,750 notification letters have been mailed. NARA is offering each individual one year of free credit monitoring services and fraud protection. To date, 796 individuals have signed up for the credit monitoring services. Because of the extremely large volume of data on the drive, over 8.7 million individual files, we do not yet know the total number of individuals whose privacy has been affected. NARA has taken steps to improve internal security in our electronic records division. First, we have added separate badge access controls to the doors opening the processing room from Suite 5300. There are now only entrances to the processing room and only individuals with badges programmed to open these doors may enter the processing room. All others must sign a log and be accompanied by an authorized person while in the room. Secondly, we conducted an audit of all electronic media containing personally identifiable information and moved it to a separate locked block of shelving within a locked stack area accessible only to authorized employees. Finally, all NARA staff are required to complete training on to handle, how to handle sensitive information, including the new security procedures. The Office of Record Services is also conducting unannounced inspections of all records branches and divisions on a periodic basis, and supervisors are required to do periodic walkthrough inspections during the day. When the investigation of this incident by NARA's Office of Inspector General and Secret Service is completed, I can assure you that we will act on the results with swift and appropriate disciplinary action if it is determined that any NARA employees were responsible for removing the hard drive or failed to adhere to proper records handling procedures. The National Archives is a public trust and the 3,000 women and men who work at NARA's 44 facilities across the country take their jobs and that trust very seriously. Every day, our staff performs work that is vital to our democracy by preserving and safeguarding the more than 9 billion records that make up the National Archives of the United States. At the same time, we must balance safeguarding and the records with providing the people of this country access to those records. As with any endeavor that relies on the work of human beings, our work, despite our best efforts and intentions, is subject to error. However, the loss of even one record or breach, even one individual's personal information, is unacceptable. And I assure you that NARA will continue to improve our security procedures and ensure that all staff is inculcated with the importance of following these procedures. Given the seriousness with which we take this loss, I am thankful for the opportunity to testify, and I will try to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Ms. Thomas. Mr. Brackfell. You're up next. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Uh, turn on your mic, please. I on? turned it off. Okay. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I thank you for offering me the opportunity to testify today. I have been called before the subcommittee to provide testimony on the circumstances surrounding an external computer hard drive missing from the National Archives and Records Administration, which contained a vast amount of material from the Clinton administration, including Presidential Record Act, or PRA, material. The Presidential Record Act of 1978 governs the official records of the President and Vice President created or received after January 20, 1981. The PRA changed the legal ownership of the official records of the President from private to public and established a new statutory structure under which Presidents must manage their records. I trust that in reaction to the loss of the hard drive, new policies, procedures, and processes will be defined and implemented at NARA. And certainly, my office will evaluate these actions to provide guidance and appropriate independent and skilled oversight. 
However, our focus now is on the criminal investigation of the disappearance of the hard drive capable of holding two terabytes of our government's information and which my forensic investigator informs me was essentially filled with data. At the outset, I must say I am not able to talk about all aspects of the investigation at this time. This is an ongoing criminal investigation which may have elements affecting national security. Therefore, I know that the chair and members of this distinguished committee would not wish me to provide any information that could potentially damage the investigation's integrity or potential success. Currently, we are working with the assistance of the United States Secret Service and the Federal Bureau of Investigation to more precisely identify the content of the hard drive. However, an initial cursory review identified that thousands of examples of personally identifiable information, or PII data, resided on the hard drive. We reported this to NARA management officials and they have hired a contractor to further analyze this PII aspect and provide breach notification per OMB requirements. I should also note that at my request, a special agent in charge of the Secret Service Washington Field Office generously made their 24-7 hotline operation available to us in order to support the investigation and potential recovery of the missing drive. In response to our suggestion, NARA has established a reward of up to $50,000 for information leading to the successful recovery of the missing hard drive. No productive leads have resulted to date from this action. The subcommittee has asked about the security in place at NARA at the time the hard drive went missing and after the hard drive went missing. The direct answer is that the controls in place were inadequate and what controls were there were readily bypassed and obviously compromised on an ongoing and dynamic basis. Quite simply, this was an accident waiting to happen and now it has. As a direct result of these failures and controls, my office's capacity to investigate this incident has been severely compromised. The loss went unnoticed potentially for months. Conservatively speaking, at least 150 people had access to the area, and even rudimentary access controls such as badge or sign-in logs were not maintained or could be readily bypassed. While the drive was kept in an area ostensibly secured by a proximity card reading lock, in practice, this system failed. People could simply piggyback by going through the door when other persons opened it, and even worse, doors which should have been secured were propped open for ventilation purposes. It was also reported to my investigators that the processing area in which the hard drive went missing was used as a conduit or shortcut to the restrooms. Therefore, it can be argued that the security for this area was no greater than the general security for the building as a whole. The loss of this hard drive holding PRA material is not the only concern I have in this investigation. Many in the pool of potential subjects of this criminal investigation have access to the processing area where this disk drive disappeared as well as more traditional storage or stack areas. Therefore, I cannot say with any confidence that data stored in these areas was not compromised. This includes the records of the 9-11 Commission, the Warren Commission, as well as large quantities of other national security holdings. In a benign case where proper controls were in place or the subject hard drive was lost or erroneously disposed of, one might take comfort that other data was not compromised. The facts dictate that I am afforded no such comfort. If the drive was deliberately removed, the person or persons could have just as readily removed other holdings or copied information onto other mediums. I am also deeply concerned about how NARA generally treated the category of presidential data like that which was on the missing hard drive. Specifically, when the data was copied from original Executive Office of the President or EOP computer tapes to modern hard drives, the copying was done by contractors off-site without any security requirements. NARA had a fixed price delivery order for the duplication of 1,428 such EOP computer tapes to external hard drives to include the missing hard drive. A small business was provided complete custody and control over the housing and content of the EOP material. Amazingly, this contract was one in a series of light contracts in which NARA was silent in addressing any security requirements for the tapes or the information which they held. In fact, the contract made no, absolutely no mention of the sensitivity of these records, nor included a non-disclosure agreement. When handling and processing groups of PRA material, I would think it essential to institute appropriate measures of security over transport and processing of of these records off-site by a contractor. However, no such measures were identified. In this specific case, the tapes were sent off-site to a small storefront operation in New Jersey. The existing security at this location was rudimentary and clearly inadequate to protect and limit inappropriate access to PRA material. In, in a June 18, 2009 letter, Senator Charles E. Grassley asked the acting archivist in the United States, do you recognize NARA as a national security agency? She stated, quote, no, NARA is not a national security agency by any shared means of that term within the executive branch for which we are aware. 
NARA does not make nor does it implement national security policy. NARA's only relationship to national security is our responsibility for ensuring that those security, security classified records that come into our custody from other agencies are stored, protected, and handled following the rules to which all agencies that handle classified records must adhere. I would submit that NARA has in this and other recent cases breached that relationship. While by some technical standards NARA may not meet the traditional definition of a formal national security agency, the information and records we hold are vital to our nation's security. When I what I will say specific to the loss of this hard drive is that the American people deserve better security and accountability than NARA has provided them. I can assure you that through our audits and investigations, management consultations and briefings, we will work to help NARA strengthen its internal control and security mechanism. While some corrective measures have and I trust will, more will be taken, it is analogous to closing the barn door after the horse has left. The event has passed and damage done, the extent of which I cannot quantify you, for you today. I thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm available to take questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Brackvale, for that. We have been joined by two additional members and I will um, yield to Mr. Mr. McHenry for his opening statement. Uh, well, I, I thank the chairman and um, uh, Ms. Thomas, thank you for uh, agreeing to join us uh, today, this time, for the hearing. Uh, and the topic today is, of course, the National Archives and, and Records Administration organizational issues, but I think that's sort of diminishing the import uh, of this. Um, and organizational issues, I think, is putting it lightly, uh, the scope and the magnitude of the problem that we're facing. The National Archives is an agency with an extremely important function. Uh, it serves as a keeper of our nation's valuable records, preserves government and historical records that include copies of acts of Congress, presidential proclamations, and federal regulations. While the archives maintains public access to some documents, other records contain highly sensitive data. Uh, Mr. Bradshfield, thank you for touching on the national security component in your, in your testimony. Uh, and these must be secured to ensure our national security and shield personally identifiable information as well. The effectiveness of the archives as protector of the records under its control is key to preserving our history and maintaining accountability in our government. The archives conducts truly invaluable work. It's very important work, obviously. Yet, they are an agency that the public doesn't often hear much about. Unfortunately, they've been getting quite a lot of press lately, all of which, or most of which, seems to be negative. In May, the National Archives Inspector General, uh, Mr. Bratchfield, Bra Mr. Bratchfeld, sorry, uh, notified Congress that an external hard drive containing national security information had gone missing from the agency's College Park facility between sometime between October 2008 and March 2009, when its absence was first noticed. That drive contained one terabyte of information. Um, and what we've come to know is that it was Clinton uh, presidency records, um, the equivalent of which are millions of books full of information, uh, as Mr. Uh, Brashfeld has previously put it. The missing data included more than 100,000 Social Security numbers, the personal contact information of presidential administration officials, the entire computer files of 113 former White House employees, Secret Service and White House operating procedures, and other highly sensitive information. Disturbingly, the missing hard drive was stored in an easily identifiable package, as Ms. Thomas uh, uh, testified to today, um, in a workspace that the archives has, ad uh, has already admitted was unsecured, un, um, unattended, and accessible to personnel without clearance. Even now, it's still not known whether the hard drive was misplaced, lost, or stolen, or even when it was actually uh, went missing. It's my hope that the National Archives management would immediately react to what has been called a catastrophic loss by tightening security and accessibility uh, at their College Park facility, particularly in the area which the hard drive was removed. However, when a bipartisan group of oversight committee staff uh, visited the campus on July 17th, they observed many of the same deficiencies in security measures and left with the impression that a motivated criminal would be able to remove sensitive material with little to no resistance. Now, this is a bipartisan assessment. Uh, there wasn't much of an effort on the part of National Archives staff to even make it appear 
that substantive changes had been made to secure the location. To be fair, the pattern of material mismanagement in the National Archives precedes Ms. Thomas' uh, uh, by quite a few years. We're still remembering Clinton administration official, National Security Advisor Sandy Berger, uh, caught walking out of the archives with his pants stuffed full, or actually rather socks stuffed full with classified uninventoried documents. There are many more alarming cases of negligence at the archives, yet none as egregious as the disappearance of the hard drive. These include the disappearance of $6 million worth of taxpayer-funded equipment over the periods of 2002 to 2006, the disposal of countless original records from the Bureau of Indian Affairs with the archives trash, and the disappearance of 55,000 pages of CIA and other federal agency records right off the shelf in 2006. There's a prevalent culture of carelessness at the National Archives, and it must be replaced with a meticulous accounting for all materials, paper and electronic, and, and uh, strident and stringent security measures that restrict access of unauthorized employees to areas where confidential data is kept. On Tuesday, President Obama announced uh, he had selected his nominee as archivist to replace Ms. Thomas, David Ferreira. Uh, quite frankly, I believe this announcement couldn't come soon enough. Mr. Ferrero has certainly had a lot of experience managing mass quantities of paper and electronic documents and other information in his tenure as Director of Research Libraries at, National Public, at the New York Public Library, and I look forward to hearing about his qualifications and his plans for the National Archives um, after, uh, at his Senate confirmation hearing, whenever the Senate really gets around to doing their job. Um, and I thank the witnesses for appearing here today. Look forward to the testimony and expl explanation of how the hard drive full of sensitive information was lost or stolen. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. We will now go into the, um, the questioning uh, stage of this hearing, and I will start it off uh, with Mrs. Norton. Five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman, and I see why you call this hearing. It's a virtually mandatory hearing in light of the circumstances and the buildup of, of, of uh, secure issues. Let me make sure what we're talking about, because as I looked at, at, at testimony, I think it's Mr. Brackenfeld's testimony. I tore it out, um, which says, uh, the hard drive contain examples of personally identifiable information. You know, the word uh, secure information is thrown around, has been thrown around the last several years so loosely. I'm trying to, to, to understand what was on the hard drive. Uh, uh, what, is it, what does it mean by personally identifiable information? Thank, is that question directed to me, Madam? Yes, Mr. Brackenfeld, that's um, fine. There's a technical definition for PII. For the purposes of this hearing, what I will define is that OMB defines PII material to include social security numbers and like material that could be used to damage a person's um, security and security, um, banking, um, for identity theft, along those lines. It could be names, addresses, associates, that kind of information. As this information was a compilation from the Clinton era um, white um, administration, it was, it was a compilation. It has information that was resided on individual computers, and thus there's information that meets that definition that resided on the hard drive that is missing. So again, it was a compilation have, of material. Have all of all of the parties whose information was compromised been so informed? I'll yield okay. to the act We're in the process of identifying the individuals that need to be notified of the breach. Uh, when did the breach occur? I'm sorry? When did the breach occur? When was it noted? At the end of March, actually on April the 2nd, it was reported to me, to uh, Mr. Brockfeld and to Mr. Stern that the hard drive had been lost. Considering the nature of the information uh, and, and that this is the month of almost August. Are you saying that most of these parties have not been so notified? 
We don't, at this point, know how many people's names and Social Security numbers are on, on the hard drive. Why do it, you not know that eight, information? There are 8.7 million individual files on this hard drive, and we have a contractor at this time trying to extract all of the data that they can to come up with the lists to go through. Is that through. contractor like this one off uh, the premises? This is another contracting out matter where people who uh, apparently uh, uh, should not have been handling secure information were doing so. Now, where, <laughs> where is this contractor located? And why couldn't this be done on the premises? So Actually, the hard drive would not have had, why did the hard drive had to leave the premises, I suppose is my question. Mr. Le Mr. Le Brackenfell. Le let me answer the, the, your last question. The hard, the process of copying the information from White House tapes or what, what were White House EOP employees tapes to the hard drive was done off site and that is what I testified regarding. That was done off site up in New Jersey and that's where I've raised significant security issues. The second part of your interest which is on now attempting to mine and identify those individuals whose PII may have been compromised, that is under a separate contract which is being administered by the archives. The reason it is taking so exceptionally long is this is probably as far as I know through my 30 year career, this is probably the greatest challenge in trying to identify. You're having to reconstruct uh, essentially what was on the hard drive with nothing to go on? What, what my investigators tried to, are trying to do and are now yielding the PII element to the contractor, what we're attempting to do is to use the latest forensic investigative software available. This is not normal data that sits in one standard language or one standard format. If you think about it, think about every record that you've ever captured for, over your career in different languages and different <coughs> spreadsheets and different formats all being compressed into one entity. It's, that's what's happened. It's not readily mineable and definable as one would think. But so nobody's been notified as of now. I yield to that. Uh, we have sent, I believe it's 15,000, somewhere between 15 and 16,000 letters have gone out to notify people the breach of their information. Do you have any idea how long it will take before all the parties have been notified? Because, or, or what kind of harm could be done in the, in, in the meantime? I think it's going to take several months. I think one of the things that this is perfectly, has made perfectly clear to us that it is very difficult to get the information off the hard drive. There are so, many so, different... So, so you think that, that in terms of a nefarious act, someone trying to use the data, that would not be very easy to do? Given that we have a contractor that was uh, suggested to us by the National Security Agency as somebody that they had worked with who they thought was the best in the field to try and do this, I do indeed believe that it was, is going to be difficult for anybody to extract this information from the hard drive. Well, Mr. Brackenfeld, do you, uh, it, it, you say a criminal investigation is, is going on. Uh, is, 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 is there any possibility other than, 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 than this being stolen uh, that you would regard as a credible possibility? I mean, could it have been mislaid if it had been mislaid? Uh, um, where would that have been since there were only two places it should be, either in the archives or with the contractor? I, I cannot dismiss any aspect as to whether or not it is missing. Um, somebody took it for purposes of benign intent just to use it for their own medium or the worst case scenario that it was taken for more nefarious purposes that that is a potential i also want to state that people with the correct technologies and tools can mine this data um, we have a contractor now that is trying to uh, my my investigation is focusing on focusing on how it happened and what the impact of the of of the loss is and if we can find the subject I'm also looking at what classified material resided on that hard drive and other sensitive information. 
I am no longer involved in looking at the PII content that has now been yielded to the contractor for working for the National Archives. What I can say is, again, people with the capacity to read this data, the tools, can do it. My investigators, my forensic auditor, could in fact pull up PII information fairly readily. Now to find the tremendous quantity to issue PII letters as the agency is doing, that's another subject. But certainly somebody with, if they had that intent, and if in fact it really is out there and somebody is using it for that purpose, certainly they could pull PII information off of that drive. Mr. Mr. Chairman, could I just ask, uh, to the extent that there is a discovery of uh, criminal use of this information that the chairman of this subcommittee be informed immediately. I don't know what people could take, could do to protect themselves, but I think the worst thing to happen in a circumstance like this is not to, not to even know that out there in the stratosphere and perhaps in, in, in the hands of, of, um, of thieves uh, uh, is all your personal information. And, and if it is discovered, it seems to me at such point it is discovered, if you're at, <laughs> If, if you're at 20,000 of 8 million or whatever, it seems to me that this committee should be informed oh, for at certain. that point. That will be made part of this uh, official hearing record. Thank you very uh, much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the question. Uh, Mr. McHenry, you read it? Uh, yes, Ms. Thomas, how long have you uh, been acting archivist? Uh, since mid December of 2008. Since mid December, okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm not familiar with most. Uh, administration officials testifying with, with counsel at the desk. It, it seems to me uh, a bit telling about the situation we're in, about how sensitive this is. Um, but, you know, Ms. Thomas, I, I know this predates you. I mean, this, is, this doesn't necessarily simply fall at your feet. So, I mean, um, how long w have you been with the archives? 39 years. 39 years, full career. So. Um, you know, there, there's been uh, studies on job satisfaction within the federal government. Um, and I think it was American University, best, practice, best places to work in the federal government, 2009, uh, American University's Institute for Study of Public Policy. Are you familiar with this study? Yes. Yes. Um, it, it was telling to me, based on our oversight committee, to see where National Archives and Records Administration ranks, it's, it's extraordinarily low in terms of job satisfaction within the federal government. It's actually, um, I think, the second to last of all the institutions they studied. Do, do you think there's a linkage between job satisfaction? Uh, well, actually, let's start here. What, what do you attribute the low job satisfaction uh, assessment to? Well, we did some. Uh further analysis of what the different rankings were in the different parts of the National Archives. And the truth of the matter is that most of the very low rankings came from our regional facilities. And we have, for example, in our federal record centers, which are fairly low paid occupations, they're not exactly intellectually stimulating, it's people moving boxes in and out and so forth. Uh, there's not a whole lot of promotion potential within the record center system and, and a great deal of the very low scores in terms of job satisfaction came from those regional activities. If you look at the National Archives in the Washington area, the, we rank at at least the same average as most other agencies or a little higher. So the regional scores basically bring the agency score down to the level that's reported in that study. Okay, okay. Uh, do you think that there's any linkages between dissatisfaction and uh, disappearance of records or theft of records? I think it, there could be, and uh, but I'm the averages for the people who are working with archival records are much higher and they're not low. The record center records, of course, are agency records, temporary records, not archival records. So the incidences that have occurred over the past several decades have occurred in archival records. Okay. So I'm not sure that the, that the linkage is there. In terms of your testimony, you said that this, this um, 
drive uh, with one terabyte of information uh, was kept in its original package. Is that true? That's, yes, that's correct. Okay. Is, is that standard uh, procedure within, the, uh, within your division of government to put, it, put these objects back in their original box? Um, in most cases, uh, information... If you don't have a policy, then that's fine, then if you'll just state that. I don't know. We'll, I could provide that for the record. I don't know the answer. Yeah, if you could, that would be good. Sure. It seems somewhat bizarre to me to have such important information. And this is not a, it's not really judging the information, you know, it, but having it lost to history is a major concern and being able to piece this back together well, on what the... Well, the information's not lost because this was a backup tape. It's a copy. Okay. Where was the original kept? What, wasn't it on the same desk? The originals are the tapes that okay. were delivered from the EOP at the end of the Clinton administration. Those tapes were backed up onto these hard drives, one of which was a master hard drive and one which was a copy hard drive. And they were next to each other? Yes, but the tapes were stored in the locked stack okay. area, the original think, records. Uh, I, uh, okay. Do you think it is, uh, is there a procedure for having a master, a, the original and the backup, the two drives, is there a process um, to keep them separate? If you have uh, uh, the backup and uh, the, the main drive, right, same information, is there a, a, uh, any policy you have within the archives to keep them in separate locations? Not while they're being processed, and that's what was happening at the, the time that the hard drives were there. It, is it not true that the reason why we don't know if it's o October or March is because they'd been sitting on someone's desk the whole time, and they were not being processed, they were left out untouched? I think it's unclear how long they were left untouched. They're, okay, they're which tells me you don't have any policies or procedures on how this works. Uh, Mr. Brackfield, it felt, I'm sorry. Um, is there, are there policies and procedures on paper within the archives about how to handle uh, two copies of the same data? I will answer your question by getting specific in this matter. In this case, I should note that drives that were not used, new, were maintained in a locked area, whereas the drives that were in process and therefore holding the kind of data and quality of data we talked about today were left in an unlocked, exposed area, put back in the original box. So to me, it seemed curious and bothersome, troublesome that a clean tapes that are locked up for security, but tapes that may have documentation were left in an open area. As far as policy and procedures, I guess, guess more specifically, that's what we're investigating. Right now, my focus is investigating a crim potentially criminal act. We have time and we will look at audit issues. We will look at new internal controls. I can simply say that, as I said in my testimony, it would seem that internal controls were not the focus in this area. Well, thank you for your testimony. and My time is up, but it, it seems to me that, that the basic archives procedure was the equivalent, the equivalent of putting your, your keys, your car keys, and your backup car key on the same keychain. It seemed uh, that it was uh, a very basic procedure that was not instituted, nor was there a culture of following those procedures to ensure that you have two pieces of data, right, kept separately, both secure, so that therefore you have in this new technology age that we have, with diminishing documents from the early 90s, uh, as, as that technology is getting older, that you would actually have those policies and procedures. So, you know, to the larger issue here is making sure that this doesn't happen again for any administration or any document. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. It, it, it begs the question of the backup system that there be a foolproof backup system. Let me, let me ask both witnesses. Uh, do you know anything about hundreds of thousands of veterans PII uh, that has been compromised uh, when the National Archives sent unencrypted hard drives to a vendor 
in return for replacement hard drives. And if you do what has been done to inform veterans that their information has been compromised. Either one? I'll, I'll answer by that by saying we are in the process, as I stated in my last semi-annual report, of conducting an investigation specific to that matter. And at this time, I do not have information to the extent that I could respond fully to that question. We do believe an event occurred. The question is, what is the nature of the event and what are the implications? We, we are currently investigating that matter. There have also been other issues related to and have been reported in a management letter related to St. Louis and the military veterans records in terms of other PII policy and procedures that have been violated that also potentially compromises veterans information. And again, that's an issue which I cannot discuss in a public forum because should that information be made available publicly, it could be damaging. So I, I respectfully uh, cannot, I, I don't think you would want me to discuss this in this public forum. Okay, well, I'll go to my next witness and ask Ms. Thomas, can you shed any light on it? I Are am unfamiliar with an incident relating to veterans records and a hard drive and missing records. I just don't okay. in, have any uh, information on that. All right. Ms. Thomas, in June of 06, uh, the Information Security Oversight Office inspected the information security controls of NARA's Washington National Records Center. Uh, ISOO found that due to in inadequate records management, hundreds of boxes of classified uh, material could not be readily located. Uh, it is my understanding that since the ISOO inspection, uh, NARA has taken steps to improve security at the Washington National Records Center. Uh, what is the status of those mix missing boxes and what has NARA done to improve the management of classified and other materials at the Washington National Records Center? Uh, there are two vaults at the Washington National Records Center. One contains top secret SCI and RD material, and the second vault contains secret and confidential uh, information. The Washington National Records Center has almost 4 million cubic feet of records. Of those, 333,000 are classified, either at the top secret SCI or secret or confidential. Uh, the controls, the ISU made recommendations, 22 different recommendations for how to improve security at the Washington National Records Center. At this stage, I believe all of them have been implemented. A uh, staff has been, um, an information security program manager has been hired, a vault manager has been hired. Um, they have completed Resources have been thrown into the record center to do a complete inventory of both vaults. And they started on the top secret and the SCI one. And they completed that inventory. Initially, they found 1,400 boxes that were not where they were supposed to be. Uh, they then did a complete check and, and determined, got that number down to, I believe, 125 boxes of material that, that is not apparently on the shelves at the Washington National Records Center. These records are owned by the agencies. They are not NARA records. They are not archival records. They are often called back by the agencies. And often what has happened in the past is that an agency calls back records and they either keep them because they're their records and they have that right and or they will send them back some months or years later in another accession so that the number changes in terms of how you identify the records and they get shelved as a new accession and they contain boxes from the old accession. So there certainly was a record keeping issue that needed to be straightened out so we could keep con better control over what went back to the agency, whether they were permanently withdrawn and kept in the agency or whether or not they were returned to the national record the Washington National Record Center we are now for the 125 boxes that are um, still 
not accounted for. Mm -hmm. We've contacted six different agencies whose records these are and asked them if they could check and find out if perhaps they've got a record of whether or not they borrowed back these records. I believe there was uh, something from the Energy Department just in the past few weeks that said, oh, yes, they've got 15 of the boxes that they've been able to account for. So we're still working the process to find out where the records are. And a similar inventory of the secret and confidential vault is underway. And we will go through the same process of completing the inventory, determining as to the best we can where the records are, and whether or not uh, the eight, they've been loaned back to the agencies or permanently withdrawn by the agencies. Okay. And uh, thank you for your response. Um, Mr. McHenry, a second round of questioning. Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, now, you, you found out about this security breach or, or the disappearance of the drive um, April 2nd, you, you said. Is that correct? Yeah, that's when I was informed. Okay. All three of us were informed. I'm, Gary's here because he's the privacy officer for mm. the agency and has responsibility for PII. Mm -hmm. um, so what have you done to address this so it doesn't happen again? The Office of, Region of uh, Record Services for Washington did a complete review of procedures and has implemented much more stringent procedures to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Some of them I uh, went through in my mm -hmm. testimony and they are in more detail in my longer testimony that's uh, submitted sure. for the yes. record. They are the, we have in, uh, put card readers on doors where before you could go into the office area and then go into the processing area. The card reader on the office door would, in essence, get you into the office area and into the processing office. Now the processing space is, has another layer of security. Mm -hmm. And so you've got different card reader access for those doors. Um, they are doing spot inspections. The uh, supervisors and managers are going through the space to make sure that the procedures that we put in place are being adhered to. Uh, we intend to do ex more training for people so that they truly get the message that this is, you know, a basic part of their job is protecting the records that they are working with and that that's a, it's a balancing act, act between providing access for research purposes and securing the items, but securing the items is a critical, critical part of their job. Certainly. Now, are you familiar with the Inspector General's report audit uh, from between October 07 and March 08? Uh, are you familiar with the audit, the Inspector General's office? Well, I see the audits, yes. Okay. Because it, it, at that point, it was, it, it was pointed out in that audit uh, that the archives was not, account, quote, not accounting for artifacts in a timely manner. It's one. Um, and two, among other things, um, artifacts were, quote, not maintained in appropriate space. Um, so the audit there expressed some of the same failings that resulted in the disappearance of this data. Um, did you have any actions you took off that audit from? Well, I think that audit re referred to the museum items, the artifacts in presidential libraries. Yes. And uh, they had, presidential libraries had started an inventory process. It was at various stages in the different libraries. Uh, we indeed poured more resources into completing the inventories and they're underway. Some of them have been completed. Uh, some of the problems that existed in the older libraries will not exist for the Bush Library or any, or any library going forward because there will be a complete computer system that tracks every artifact as it arrives in the White House. And then that system is provided to us so that we will have a complete list to start out with. The record keeping in the White House gift office wasn't as complete. and in the past, and it was 
um, not consistent, if I can give you uh, an example. Uh, a tea set, is that one item? Or is that a teapot and four cups? And is there a tray? Is that seven items? You know, there was no consistency in how they dealt with it. So but within one division of the archives, when you have issues like, you know, not having information secured in an appropriate space, does that raise questions for the overall system? Do you look at overall systems within the archives, or is that just one division and therefore isn't uh, applicable to anywhere else? For the uh, issue with the hard drive, we are, going, we are going to undertake a complete review. The Office of, of Record Services in Washington has already started. I thought you said they've already the done procedures. that. I'm sorry? I thought you said in my last question that they'd already done a complete review. They did it for the, the Electronic Records Division. They are branching out to all of their records holdings unit and, and, as you said, looking at it more holistically across the agency as opposed to just in one division. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at all security procedures and whether or not they are sufficient, whether they need to be improved. We certainly have decided that we need to improve our training and that we need training at a lot of different levels. For example, uh, I'm proposing that we will train every employee that comes to the National Archives as part of their orientation, whether they're a budget analyst or whatever, to make them understand what the mission of the agency is and that everybody has a responsibility to make sure that records are protected. Thank you. Thank you. Very good answer. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Um, Ms. Thomas, um, Re regarding the notices uh, that were sent out, sent out to the 16,000 roughly uh, people, uh, were there any problems with the notices? Uh, I, I have received reports uh, that recipients of those notices thought that they were scams. We did have some uh, questions come into, we had a, a hotline set up for any questions that anybody did have. And we also had an email box where they could contact us. And yeah, the most frequently asked question that, that came to us was, is this a scam? Is this somebody who's, you know, prints so-and-so from somewhere who's, <laughs> you know, trying to get hold of my, my personal information and drain my bank account or something? Um, so we have... Uh, answered those questions and I Gary if you have anything to add to that Mr. Stern I can try yes um, the letters were sent out by our contractor uh, who's the contractor providing the credit monitoring uh, services as well and so while it's on NARA letterhead it's it was put in an envelope um, that looks more like the kind of envelope you'd get from you know, a bank or, or some, something else. Solicitation. So, so, exactly. So I think some people thought, weren't sure, is this really from the National Archives or is this just some company trying, not just trying to, you know, solicit my business. And so we assured those people that it really was from us. We referred them to our website and, and we put up an updated notice to say, we have sent these letters out and they are legitimate and, and, and we are informing you of this potential breach and offering this service. So there, there was some confusion that we just hadn't occurred to us that that would result um, by sending out the letters in that format. I see. Any recommendations, Mr. Brackville? Specific to that question? Yes. Um, I'm pretty much apart from that process. Again, my, my duty is to do the investigations. We reviewed the language in the breach notification letter just as a courtesy, and the language in the breach notification seemed to be appropriate. As far as the contract or the mailing, that's completely outside of my domain. So there was really two mailings then. Did you, did you remail the, the notices or no? No. no? no, 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 but there was an email box set up, and in the letter that announced, that notified people of the breach, they were provided with the email address, they were provided with a hotline number that they could call, and they were notified that they could look at our website for further information so that if they had any questions about the breach notification letter, they could contact us in several different ways. On the uh, 
Re, uh, Ms. Thomas, regarding the copying of executive office computer tapes onto this hard drive, um, why were security requirements not built into the contract documents with, with your vendor? Well, the contract that, uh, contractor that did the uh, work on the latest batch of copying, because there were like five different contracts, I believe, for various stages of copying of this material, uh, was a GSA schedule contract with the uh, routine, I'll say routine, because they were, uh, clauses about protection of government information, government products that were produced or were provided to the contractor. In hindsight, they should have, our people should have included some additional security requirement clauses in the contract. And that will certainly be a part of any contract going forward. Okay, Ms. Brackfield, any comment on that? Um, I have pretty much all the documentation related to this contract. And what's clearly missing is any, any mention of security as even a consideration within the body of any of the, the solicitation. The company that received the tapes did not even in, respond in terms of their having any security arrangements in place. Mm. Um, again, there was no clause for non-disclosure of information as is, should be customary in such a contractual relationship, contractual document. Um, basically, it just shouldn't have happened. And this I think is, the, the archives will learn from that. This sounds pretty sloppy as far as how we handle um, sensitive information. We visited the site, and it's not the contractor's fault per se, because the contractor was doing a duplication service. They were honoring the terms of the contract. It's, but if you went to the contractor's site, as my agents did along with other law enforcement, you would see in a basic storefront operation with security clearly not the focus. You would see that the tapes were kept in a, sh in a room where doors were propped open also. You would see, I have actually images of this, uh, and it will be in my investigative report when it's finalized, or I could present them to you at, at, at subsequent to this hearing. Um, it was not the environment that one would expect. You would keep something of even minimal importance, much less the quality and quantity of data that we've discussed today. You can certainly share whatever information you, you, you can uh, with this subcommittee uh, so that, I will do uh, that we can get a clear picture of it. I will, uh, I'll stop there and let, you, let Mr. McHenry have the last round of hearing uh, questions. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for having this hearing. I think it's important that uh, we get the right policies and procedures in place. And this is not necessarily an adversarial thing. I mean, I, I'm just perplexed at how something so basic uh, could disappear. And, um, you know, th these, these hard drives, in my experience, aren't cheap to, to get anyway. Uh, they're not cheap objects to have lying around, much less w with no information, much less with sensitive information on it. And so it seems to me that even so much as actually taking that hard drive instead of leaving it out, putting it in a locked desk drawer would have been a world apart from what happened, or near as we can tell happened um, with the minimal amount of information that's actually known right now. And uh, I know the IG still has the investigation going on, and I would love to have uh, any final, any information as you produce it that you're able to share with us. Uh, we'd certainly appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, thank you for having this hearing, and thank you for your leadership. Thank you, too, Mr. McHenry. Uh, and uh, since there are no, no further questions, uh, that concludes this hearing. Um, committee is adjourned. Thank you.
Bones, bed sores, dehydration, and malnutrition are all signs of abuse or neglect. Understaffing, the rehiring of repeat offenders, and patient deaths due to broken equipment or medication errors have been reported. If you believe that a loved one has been a victim of nursing home abuse or neglect, call 1-800-793-0534. That's 1-800-793-0534. The Travel Bug's got Samantha wasting her weekend away. Oh! All right, who wants a margarita? Let's hope she doesn't regret anything on Monday. Samantha Brown's Great Weekends, Florida Keys, all new Saturday at 10. Only on the Travel Channel. Catch it. The next stop on our tour of America's best barbecue takes us somewhere you might not expect. Wine country. In California's Central Coast Valley, is a singular barbecue style named for West Coast cattle country. Welcome to Santa Maria. Sometimes to reach barbecue paradise, you can stay right where you are and have this heavenly smoked cuisine brought to you. Billy and Sue Ruiz are the proprietors of Cowboy Flavor, a catering service specializing in authentic Santa Maria style barbecue. We don't cover anything. We don't put any sauce on anything. We try to let the meat sell itself. Oh, you want to cook? Good beef over an open oak wood fire, and that's truly traditional Santa Maria style. Traditional Santa Maria style pits, they all have adjustments. See, you've got a handle of some kind to raise that screen up and down, and your fire will tend to flame up a little bit. So we'll want to get the meats up and away from the fire. We're going to add a little red oak to this fire. The beef's own flavor is only enhanced by the wood smoke and a blend of spices. Everybody's seasoning is kind of unique to this area too. Most of us start off with a garlic salt and pepper base and then we add to that. To many barbecue purists, cooking directly over the flame like this is grilling, not barbecuing. But to Californians, the Santa Maria style is as valid as any other style, dating back over a hundred years to the immigrants who worked on California ranches in the 19th century. Got three sticks of linguiça. It's Portuguese sausage, a little spicy, not hot. The foundation of this meal is Swiss Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, and have all blended into making this meal that satisfies everybody. Sausage hors d'oeuvres, pinquito beans, and salsa are some traditional side dishes. Even the word barbecue is a Portuguese import. Translation of barbacoa is cooking large chunks of meat over an open fire. Mmm, look at that sizzle. It's a unique flavor. Part of it's the wood, part of it's the meat, part of it's the seasoning, part of it's all the company and family and friends you've got around you eating it too. So there it is, folks, Santa Maria style barbecue at its finest. From Rancho Ruiz, head 33 miles south down the 101 freeway, and you'll find another barbecue paradise, The Hitching Post, located in the city of Buellton. I'm Frank Ostini, and you're at my Hitching Post restaurant in Buellton, California. I'm the chef, owner, and winemaker.